Friends, thank you, thank you so much for coming here tonight in the forest ground to have this wonderful open air rally. If I can let you know that tonight this event is the 43rd leadership event we've done in the past six weeks in every part of this country, Scotland and Wales also. And we're reaching out to very large numbers of people because these open air events mean that there's obviously no charge involved, there's no limit on the size of the crowd and anyone can come along and be involved. Surely that is the kind of community and that is the kind of politics we all want to be part of. Where you can all come along and be involved. <laughs> Events like this, of course, do not happen by accident and there are many people who put a lot of work into arranging tonight's event. I want to say a big thank you to Uma, to Steve Battlemuch, and a whole team that put so much effort into organising tonight's event. Let's hear it for them. And all the others who've spoken tonight, and all that they've said, and the different causes that they've brought to our rally and to our election campaign. Because this is an election campaign that is designed to bring all those different causes together. Because quite simply, if you pursue a cause on your own, you might win, you might not win, but you're going to be pretty lonely and often isolated. When you do it together with everybody else, suddenly an awful lot of things become possible. In that unity is our strength. And I also want to say thank you to some other people who are here tonight, particularly to my great friend Alan Simpson, former MP for Nottingham South, for all that he's done as MP, but also, and I'll come back to this in a moment, the fantastic work he's done on our environmental and energy generation policies. because. We have a lot of things to bring to the table and a lot of things to bring to the people of ideas that things can be done and they will be done differently. I also want to thank Chris Williamson, former MP for Derby, coming here tonight and all his support and the fantastic event that we held in Derby. I'm going to say that the crowd in Derby and the crowd here are exactly the same. <laughs> I think that would be the diplomatic solution. Can we agree on that? Thank you. Total unity between Derby and Nottingham. It's been achieved. What more can we ask for? And there are so many groups and campaigns here tonight. People that have done so much to campaign against cuts in disability payments by this government. Thank you for being here tonight and what you're doing to unite the union for the work that it's done on many issues, but particularly the disgraceful conditions at Sport Direct at Shirebrook, and I'll be coming to that in a moment. There's another group here who I hope you'll make your way over to and say hello to them at the end and offer them your support. That's the Mine Workers Pension Scheme campaign. The miners working in dangerous conditions, fought back for health and safety at the workplace, fought back for union recognition, were the bedrock and the backbone of the Labour movement and the Labour Party for so long. They were attacked by Thatcher and destroyed by Thatcher as a mining industry. But the one thing that Margaret Thatcher and the Tories never get and never understand is simply this, you don't destroy the spirit of cooperation, that spirit of unity of the mining community. So when they come to skim off the miners' pension scheme, we are alongside the miners, not the skimmers. <clears throat> so the campaign at one level is, of course, a campaign for the leadership of the Labour Party. 
and we didn't seek this election. We had that election a year ago. We had that election a year ago and we had debates and hustings and meetings and rallies all over the country and a result was obtained. I consider that result to be a mandate to oppose austerity and lead the party into a direction of solidarity with those who are suffering, not walking by on the other side when welfare reform, for example, is proposed. But we have another leadership election and that's absolutely fine. This is one of many events that we've done, as I've explained, but it's also an opportunity to put out an awful lot of ideas for policy discussion and say to everyone who's involved in community life and politics, who's involved in the Labour Party or trade unions, registered supporter or whatever else you are, look at the things we put out, look at the ideas that are there. They're not in stone, they're not the last word on anything, they're not the total wisdom on everything. But they are, I'm sure you would all agree, decent, intelligent, radical ideas that can all be expanded on and developed. When we do things together, we're stronger. When we develop policies from people who are the experts, because they're the ones working in the NHS, working in social care, working in industries across the country, teaching in our schools, looking after those that desperately need support. They are the ones who really are the experts on how those policies can develop. So I urge you all, get involved, stay involved, be involved, and make sure your voice is heard. That is democracy from the ground up, not expertise from the top down. I'll give you a couple of examples of some of the, just some of the policy launches we've done recently. A week ago, we launched a policy on the digital economy and inclusion in it. The need for effective and efficient broadband access to all parts of the country. The need for everyone to have access to a digital economy. The need to develop that and the need for young people to be able to develop their expertise with good quality training, good quality apprenticeships, in good quality colleges. You don't achieve that if at the same time you're cutting back on EMA, cutting back on the support for students, or taking away their ability to survive because the wage rates are so low. And then, last week, we were at the Edinburgh Festival and at the Edinburgh Festival we launched a cultural policy for the whole of the UK. It's a cultural policy that quite simply says this, we all have cultural values, we all have musical, poetic and artistic instincts. There is a poet, there is a musician somewhere in all of us. Let our children grow up in schools that provide music lessons and education. Give them, give them the chance, give them the chance to act, to dance, to dream. Give them the chance to be part of that cultural life of all of us. It's not necessarily all that expensive, but it is very important to do it. If we underfund our local theatres and close them down, if we underfund and close down our libraries, if we return to the elitism of the past, that classical music is only for those that can afford it, then we're turning our backs on a huge cultural opportunity and identity. So let's encourage young musicians, encourage them to get the rehearsal space they need, encourage our public music venues to encourage them at the same time. Something good about inclusion of arts and culture in society for all of us and it's a developing economy as well. <laughs> and we've launched other policies including, including an agenda for the way in which women are treated in our society, the way in which the, the gender pay gap 
but Tainsley in some cases has got worse. The way in which girls are often not given all the options and the opportunities they should be given. The sky should be limit, the limit for anyone. And so these policies are obviously important ways of taking things forward. And we've summarised those in ten fundamental points. The key to it is this, is about the way in which we approach, approach the economy. When we lost the last general election in 2015, like I guess pretty well everybody here, I was angry, I was upset, I was devastated, I was annoyed, I was disappointed, I was everything. Because I knew there was going to be a Tory government and what it would do. But then I reflected on that election campaign and that offer. And there were good things on offer, absolutely, there were good things on offer. But the problem was, we were still wedded to the idea that the banking crash of 2008-9 was somehow or other caused by the numbers of doctors, numbers of nurses, numbers of teachers, number of short start centres, or whatever else we had in our economy, when in reality it was caused by an unregulated banking sector and the greed of the bankers that went with it. And since then, and since then, we've had six years of austerity, six years of falling living standards for the worst off, six years of frozen wages for those in the public sector, in reality, of course, a wage cut, and devastating cuts in local government budgets all across Britain. But it's not an even cut, it's not an even effect that's taken place. If you had a map of Britain set out here on this beautiful park and you covered the areas of greatest poverty, greatest need and lowest wages and shortest life expectancy in red and then you overlaid them with another map of the areas that have had the greatest cuts to local government expenditure, the deepest underfunding of their health services, the least levels of central government investment in infrastructure and you say he chose the colour maybe blue for that one. I tell you what, the blue would obliterate the red because that is what austerity has done. That is what this Tory government is doing to the poorest and most vulnerable parts of this country. So I was delighted when John McDonnell agreed to accept the position as Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. And the first thing John did and I want to thank John and his team and Becky Long Bailey who's taken over as Shadow Secretary to the Treasury for the work that they have done. The work that they've done in offering an economic alternative. An alternative way of running the economy. You start from the principle that everybody matters. You continue with the principle that public investment is a good thing, not a bad thing that you face a crisis like that in the steel industry with a public sector involvement, that you deal with issues of challenging austerity and you measure success or failure by the effects of the number of children you bring out of poverty, the inequality you reduce, the life expectancy you increase, the homeless you rehouse. You measure success on the basis of bringing about a better more equal, more decent society, rather than the Tory method of saying, well, tax cuts for the top, social spending cuts for the bottom, and somehow or other call it success. Well, it ain't success, it's total failure. <laughs> and so John has developed this economic model, but he's also looked in doing this at rights at work, the way people are treated at the workplace, the right to form cooperatives, the right to work as buyouts, all of those issues. But fundamental to that is the right to be represented, the right, the positive right to be a member of a trade union and have that union represent you when your employer is ill treating you. So we get rid of zero hours contracts. We get rid of insecurity at work. And I must say, I had a bit of a chuckle to myself when I was watching um, the Born Again 
socialists of Mike Ashley on the television last night <laughs> saying that he had learnt lessons from what happened in Shirebrook. Well, I've got a feeling he knew what was going on in Shirebrook all along. And I've got a feeling that the reports that Unite had given were very public because I read them. That the disgraceful treatment of workers in Shirebrook had to be addressed. And it took Unite the Union to take up the cause. It took a parliamentary select committee to force the repayment of a million pounds in unpaid wages. But Shirebrook and Sport Direct are a symptom, a symptom of a malaise, a malaise in our society in the way in which we have lack of respect for people doing vital and important jobs for underpaid, underrepresented and treated with contempt. And so it is about rights at work. It's also about protecting the holidays that we obtained through European regulation, the maternity and paternity benefits we obtained, the working time directive and all of those things. And so we don't allow the Tories to use the Brexit negotiations to tear up every social agreement we've ever reached and the whole move towards social justice that we have set in portrayed in this election campaign and others. And there are vital issues about investment in our society. Therefore, John's proposal of a national investment bank with £500 billion of investment to improve railway lines, to improve public buses, to improve housing, education and health within our society are absolutely crucial. And make sure that investment is fairly and evenly spread across the country. The East Midlands has the lowest level of government investment of any region in Britain. That fairness means there have to be some big changes in the way in which policy decisions are made. Today, at Prime Minister's Question Time, I decided to take the issue of housing as the theme of the six questions that I'm allowed to put to the Prime Minister. And I pointed out that the free market mentality on housing doesn't actually do any good for anybody in our society except those that benefit from high prices and high rents. And they're never the people that are buying, they're never the people that are renting. They're always the other side of the coin. So I pointed out to her that the sale of council housing, the forced sale of council housing by councils in high cost areas reduces the chances of many people getting somewhere decent, safe and secure to live. The alternative must be to invest invest in good quality, lifetime tenancy, socially rented council housing. And we're paid to build 500,000 during the first term of the next Labour government so that we do do something about housing injustice in this country. And then when they talk about the private rented sector, I was able to point out to her today that the private rented sector, largely unregulated, and the rent levels are very high in some parts of the country, high in many parts, add up to a total payment from the DWP budget of £9.5 billion pounds every year in housing benefit to subsidise very high rents within our society. Wouldn't it be so much better if instead of investing all that money, or even some of that money, into subsidising rents, we put it into bricks and mortar, bathrooms and toilets, bedrooms and rooms, building houses, the flats that people need. And so that investment in housing has a virtuous circle, a reward everywhere, all the way around. A family gets decently housed, Building workers get jobs in building those houses and all down the supply chain of making all the things you need to build a house or a flat get jobs as well. It becomes an investment in a growing economy, not a spending on the misery of housing insecurity that is so much the norm across the country.
we had a brilliant speech on behalf of those that are genuinely campaigning to defend our National Health Service. Our health service was created by those with vision for everybody after the Second World War. And Aaron Bevan led it through. It was the whole Labour movement that put it into operation. And it came from bitter campaigning in isolated and cold places all through the recession of the 1930s and all those that had an idea that society could be done differently. And we're all afraid of getting ill. Of course we are. But let's not be afraid of the financial cost of getting ill. That is where the principle of healthcare free at the point of use is so important as a human right. That healthcare free at the point of use as a human right is a very precious thing. But it's under threat. It's under threat from underfunding. It's under threat from privatisation. It's under threat from a government that's more interested in attacking junior doctors than supporting them and the brilliant work that they do in keeping us all in good health. And there is another aspect of the health service that I want to see dramatically changed and that is addressing the crisis of mental health services within our society. A quarter of us in our own lifetime will suffer some kind of difficulty. Some of us will get through it with love, support, affection from friends, neighbour and families. Some of us will get the talking therapy we need. Some of us will get the urgent treatment we need. Sadly, some won't. Either because it's not there, or the waiting list is too long, or because of the way in which we treat issues of mental health in our society, they'll be too afraid to talk about it. There's got to be something deeply, deeply tragic about those who feel they are so isolated and in such a difficult place, they end up taking their own lives as a result of it. So let's be clear, we will stand up against those that denigrate people that are going through a crisis. We will have the act of decency and solidarity surrounding them. And we will fund mental health services properly so those in crisis don't have to wait. There is so much that we have to do. We have to bring our schools away from the whole idea that there's a competition between every school and that every student must be deeply in debt for trying to get an education and go to university. Or well, that young people wanting to do an apprenticeship don't get the chance to do it, or the apprenticeship they've got is not of terribly good quality. We have a danger that we've turned education into a commodity to some extent under five and into a complete extent over the age of 18. Other countries do it differently. They see education as a right, but they also see it as a benefit to all of us. So if somebody becomes a good doctor, a good engineer, a good lawyer, a good accountant, a good care worker, all the things that we need, then we all benefit as a society. There is no joy in preventing people getting the education and training they want and we all need. Let's be big enough and proud enough to say we will invest more in education to give real equality of chance and opportunity to everybody. And this year, for the first time for many years, the numbers of working class students going to university has started to come down. That's not right, that's not necessary, that's not acceptable. We have different ideas and we intend to develop those ideas and put them into practice. Today in Nottingham we launched our environmental and energy policy. I was proud to do it here in Nottingham because of the work that Alan and Steve and others have done on Robin Hood Energy, the work they've done on the idea that communities and cooperatives coming together empower us all, help us to protect our environment and help to give lower costs and decent standards of living for everybody. We've learnt a lot from what we've 
learnt from Robin Hood energy. And so we want to develop an energy policy that recognises that unless all of us face up to the issues of environmental damage and climate change and do something about it by empowering communities to decide on their future energy strategy, the level of solar power they want to use, the level of wind power they want to use, and that we as a community invest in renewables and invest in a sustainable energy system. So our whole environmental strategy is about empowering, but is about changing the thinking process so that we recognise around the world there are environmental refugees. We recognise that in our own society 29,000 people die because of air pollution in all of our major cities. Not necessary and not right. It requires tough regulation, it requires the empowerment of communities on energy generation, it, it requires all of us to have an idea that we have to protect our environments, protect our environment, not by denying people social justice, but by saying social justice and fair energy policies are actually one and the same thing with environmental protection. Another virtuous circle in, in progressive policy thinking of what we're putting forward. So all these ideas add up to many, many things. Many, many things. And that is really about the way in which we want our society to develop and our politics to develop with it. This Labour Party now has a membership of well over half a million. 300,000 people have joined the party in the past year. And hundreds of thousands more have come because they're interested in the idea that we offer an alternative economic strategy. We offer an alternative cultural strategy, housing strategy, health strategy, and we offer a different way of looking at the world. I'm sure many of you who are there here tonight on this, this wonderful rally would have marched against the Iraq war in 2003. Indeed, I attended meetings and rallies in Nottingham during that period. It was a desperate time and desperate days. We didn't march against the Iraq war because we were in favour of the human rights abuses of Saddam Hussein or the regime. Indeed, some of us had actually campaigned against arms sales to that regime because of what they were doing to people within that country. But we pointed out that a war in Iraq would have terrible consequences. Consequences that would flow for a very long time. And we now see a whole region at war. We see a whole region of uh, victims, of refugees, of people looking for a place of safety. So I simply say this, shouldn't our default position be that to approach a conflict you try and reach a political settlement and an agreement? to approach the world on the basis that our signatory, signature to the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights means something. That the European Convention on Human Rights means something. Our Human Rights Act means something. And a foreign policy based, and a trade policy based on respect for human rights and justice around the world will get us a lot further than going to war in Afghanistan or Iraq and the price that has been paid by the thousands who died as a result of those conflicts and the thousands who are still dying as a result of all the other conflicts that have developed since then. And so last year we promised we would give an apology for the Iraq war and the decision that was made and we did that in front of an audience of families of those that have lost their loved ones as soldiers in Iraq. We need a foreign policy of humanity, human rights, peace, justice and democracy. Those should be surely our watchwords of the kind of society we want to live in and the kind of world we want to live in as well. So, our campaign 
is about democracy within the Labour movement and the Labour Party. It is about thinking about things differently. But above all, it's about the empowerment of people. The empowerment of people to control their own economy, to decide the future of their own lives and their own community. It's simply wrong the levels of injustice and inequality in Britain. It's simply wrong the regional levels of inequality. It's simply wrong that in one of the richest countries in the world, several thousand people sleep on the streets at night and beg for their very survival. We can, should and must do things very differently. We create a society and a community where no one, no community and nobody is left behind. This rally tonight comes on the back of many others, comes on the back of support and endorsement from so many others. And something that really touched me yesterday was getting thanks and support from UB40. Wasn't that so great? Thank you very much.